Hello, everyone. It's five past the hour. Let's start. First of all, I would like to thank you for joining our introduction event about GTFS and GPFS and also all the open source tools and ecosystem where well, uh, mobility data has developed around them. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you my co-host, Newton. Hello, everyone. Super excited to have you here and joining us today for this training session. As my colleague Tuto mentioned, my name is Newton Davis. I'm normally based in Berlin. Um, I've been working with mobility data for the last year. Um, and super excited about the opportunity to share a little bit more with you about standard specifications that we work on, as well as GTFS and GPFS. As you can see, my background is quite varied. History of studies and international relations, but I think it's really allowed me to be a valuable asset to the team and helping to make sure that we can move towards a world that's more sustainable and thinking about how we can be uh, socially responsible with our travel. I'll uh, hand it back over to Tuto for her introduction. Hello, everyone, again. So I'm Tuto, the Director of Partnership and Events at Mobility Data. I'm based in France, and you can reach out to me in French, English. Vietnamese, if you speak it, Spanish and Japanese. Uh, I have a background in industrial engineering and project management. And what I believe is what we're doing today is very important because we are leveraging technology to support better community inclusion. Now I will give it back to Newton for the first part. Excellent. So we're super excited today to share with you a little bit about our work with GTFS and GBFS. But before we get there, we'd like to level set to make sure that everyone is understands exactly what we're talking about. Um, so we'll be talking first about what standard specification and open source are, and then we will get into the meat of our presentation, which is talking about an introduction to GTFS and GBFS. With respect to standards and specifications, so a data specification, as it says here, enables uh, the exchange of information in a way that ensures all parties agree on what the information represents. So another way of saying that is a specification is the first step of making our way to a standard. It's more like a, a de facto way of, of saying that. Um, you can think of it in many ways of as a dictionary, um, where each term has a definition, and a set of rules for how it can be used. And as that dictionary becomes more and more defined and more and more people agree that the information in that dictionary is uh, correct, um, it can be moved from the space of a specification to a data standards. For the case of other existing standards out there, we know that international bodies such as ISO and CEN um, focus on creating standards for relevant data and relevant organizations operations worldwide, but we don't really focus on those, those things. And in terms of mobility data, we focus specifically on, on, on data specifications. And in cases of questions, there's sort of two definitions of, of standards. Um, there's the, the fourth Oxford definition, which is a system or method that is the usual way of measuring and producing or doing a particular thing in a particular field of activity. Um, and then there's the, the other kind of standard, which is the international standard, which is governed by a treaty or formal governance process, which are those that we are more familiar with. So the work that we are talking about today is specifically around standards that are more like in that second category where there, there's a formal governance process. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about our governance process at, at Mobility Data. But the idea is that we are thinking about how we can create uh, specifications um, and move those specifications from the realm of, of a few people agreeing on them um, to a standard that is endorsed by the industry and governed by Mobility Data. In order to like identify and, and make sure that people really understand why this is important, we're going, because I think at a high level, we understand, okay, it's important, but people are like, what kind of data is really necessary for us to standardize around mobility information? Um, and so to make that example very clear, we're going to sort of take a step back from things like mobility and, and we'll, we'll just put it in a context of, of food so that everyone understands exactly like why when we think about digitizing information that exists in the real world, we have to be very, very careful about what language you use, specifically that dictionary that we talked about, about the specifications. And then 
even more so about if we want to create a, a space or environment where there's a lot of interoperability and people across different geographies or different types of organizations can use the same language and become a standard, um, what difficulties might ensue from that and, and how do we get to a point where that's possible. So to do that, we'll talk about this food pleasure index, which is a made up um, example, but I think for, for the most part, uh, it, it should give us a, an opportunity to understand and we all love food. Um, for those of you in Europe, it's early in the morning, so maybe you all are, are hankering for something delicious for breakfast. And for those of you in Arab, uh, in, in in Asia and um, in Australasia, um, maybe you'll be uh, be wanting something for for lunch or dinner. But uh, we'll go ahead and get started just to make sure that 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 this makes sense. So with this food pleasure index, what we're aiming to do is describe the food that we see on the screen and there are ways that we want to describe that digitally. We have our main ingredients, you know, we have the toppings and we have the sauces and, and, and the idea is how do we, how do we represent that? So if you and I were to, to talk about it right now, you can see in this, this chart that we have our main ingredient, which is lettuce. We have the temperature of the salad, which we would say is warm or cold. We have crunchiness of the salad, which we describe as you know sufficient or not. Uh, and then you have the quantity of the salad, which we would say is big enough, not big enough, you know, sufficient, not sufficient to make to fulfill my needs. But when we start to dig into that, we said the main ingredient was 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 lettuce. But what exactly? How how do we get to that point? Right, uh, this salad has lots of different things on it. We see there's tomatoes. We see there's radish. We see there's broccoli. Who determines which ingredient is the main ingredient, especially as we try to represent this digitally, right? We just say at the bottom of the screen, you can see that the digitally represented, the main ingredient is lettuce. How do we get to that point? So we'll say that we, we described that by saying that it's whatever is the largest present ingredient by weight, which is fine. Okay, we, we'll, we'll take that. And now we're thinking about how, how do we describe the temperature? Before, at the beginning, we said the temperature is, you know, good. We, we, we saw that there was a number there. We see that there's 18 at the bottom of the screen, but that is because we are describing the temperature in terms of degrees Celsius. Is that something that we think is okay? If, if we can all agree on that, then we can say that, well, instead of saying that the temperature is good or sufficient, or warm or cold, we'll, we'll say that it's measurement of the food or temperature in the food in degrees Celsius, which is okay. We next have this next quality, which is crunchiness. So we have, you know, to describe how crunchy we think the food is. And, and we'll do that via this multi-dimensional scale of a flight scale, which is something that you can sort of see at the bottom of the screen. We didn't, we didn't make this up, but the idea is that you can quantify exactly how crunchy something is using the scale. So instead of just saying, yeah, the crunchiness is good or bad, you can say that we'll actually uh, use this particular scale to, de to define it. And lastly, in terms of quantity, before we were saying, you know, it's good enough, meaning that like it made me full or it didn't make me full. And now we'll actually describe that in terms of grams um, so that we have very clear now uh, specifications or very clear ways in which we describe these ingredients in the set, this index, which makes it very easy for anyone in the world to compare uh, the salads that they might have, uh, which as before, we had a number of different ways that individuals could describe it. And each one of those individuals could have a different way of uh, addressing each one of those fields. So now as we get deeper into this, we see that there are, even on this wet scale, when you go and you take a look at what happens there, it very quickly a, a problem appears in that it, it may not necessarily work for everyone. There's still in this standard scale for, for food, this wet scale, it's quite subjective. Like, how do we get to this number of six? And, you know, getting to the number of six on this wet scale might vary depending on cultural backgrounds or where people find themselves or, you know, what, what they're feeling at that particular point, point in, day, in the day. And so we want to get a little bit more specific here. So we'll say, instead of using the sweat scale, maybe let's give ourselves some options to choose from, as opposed to sort of giving people a lot of leeway to describe it. Let's just create a, a, a drop down essentially. Um, and through that, we you see here that we've said, okay, instead of it, there's a scale from one to 10. We'll now just give you four options to be able to describe your food. It can be raw, it can be gelatinous, it can be crunchy, it can be dehydrated. And now that limits the way that we can describe it, but it also improves the ability for us to communicate those things 
um, across different geographies and across different kinds of people without there being any miscommunication or any sort of lack of clarity in what people are trying to describe. So I think all in all, what, what we have seen here is that like a language, we have to define sort of who the speakers are and who the users are, which we, we kind of know because we work in this mobility space. But most importantly, we have to understand what are the rules. And those rules are like the spelling and grammar. And that spelling and grammar is the bread and butter of how we communicate with one another. And in order for that to work, we must be on the same page about it. And so this diverse uh, vernacular practice that exists must be codified in a way um, through authorities that have power to, to be able to do that. So in, in a lot of ways, we think of these data specifications like, like language. Um, and we think of the standards that, that come about from that yeah, as, as this dictionary that help us govern. Um, and once we have these dictionaries, it becomes very easy for us to create all these additional services and tools that allow us to use that language well. We're all very, very familiar with spell check. And we know that things like Grammarly exist that can help us write these languages easier. But that only works when there are clear standards and clearer ways of using language and the same with mobility data standards and specifications and lots of other standard specifications that exist out there after you have had this sort of direct specification that that, that is clear and understood you can then create a, lo a lot of tools to you know be a translator translator between different specifications um, or you can create opportunities again for there to be tools that ch check the validity of those things to make sure that they're complete or written in the right way um, and I think it's important to say that like, like language, the specifications evolve, you know, they're born in certain circumstances, they evolve and they die. Uh, GPFS, for example, was born out of a, a need that, ex that didn't exist 15 years ago. Um, it just, just in the last decade, have we seen this emergence of uh, a shared mobility, um, specifically with bike share, and there's been a need to update the language that we use around mobility to be able to keep, keep pace with what happens. Just like language adopts new words, every year we hear the Oxford Dictionary um, add new, new words to the dictionary so that uh, it can keep pace with the, the changing English language. So too must the specifications that we use adapt and evolve because if they don't, uh, they might die. And the, the death of them may not necessarily be a bad thing. It just is a representation of, of a change in the, the physical environment that we live in and their usage, right? And, and their success depends on, on their use, which is our last thing here. And, and I think that that is one of the things that we are really excited about at Mobility Data is to have specifications in-house, GTFS and GBFS specifically, that are widely used. Um, and we hope that over the course of this training program today, you will understand exactly how these specifications came to be, what they, they pretend to do, and how you as an organization um, can use them to further your goals of making your mobility information more accessible for everyone. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the open source element of this and, and why that's important. So uh, we've now set the stage for standards and specifications, and we understand that, that there are many of them that exist um, and why they exist to sort of create this codified language in which everyone speaks. But there are different jobs that these data standards can do. So there's the audience, right? So depending on who you are, the information that you might want to know about something is quite different. For example, GTFS, GBFS, um, and GTFS on demand show information that travelers have um, and have agreed to generally in real time. So what that means is that this is information that is relevant for travelers. That could be a whole different set of information that is relevant for a fleet manager, right? Who might wanna know more about the status of the, the vehicle that, that, that's on the street or that may wanna know exactly where their operations team is. So I think it's important to make the distinction that like the, what jobs do these data standards do uh, and what jobs do, do we do? So it really is focused on the audience. So it can be, be based on that. It can be focused on a timeline that there's the static information that's relevant for that could just be vehicle information. There's real time information about you know where are the vehicles right now. There's historic information about like where are the where have the vehicles been, and the standards and specifications that exist within the space can address any combination or any one of those things individually. And some examples that we have here are the GTFS archives can show how services have changed over time within public transit right? or. or can see that you know five years ago in Paris there might have been these routes and now through, through using GTFS archives we can see that 
comparing that to what exists in GTFS today, we can see how those things might, might change. And the GBFS, for example, can show how many shared vehicles are available on the street right now. Um, and that might be useful as we think about putting that into applications like mass applications that want to inform people what kind of options they have. And then lastly, we can, in, in, in addition to the audience, in addition to the time, we have the purpose. Um, we can think about trip planning and discovery. We can talk about regulation and enforcement and pricing policies. So all of these are ways in which the standards can be used to inform different audiences about operations in various points in time. And like I said, at, at the bottom, the examples of, of what those purposes can do, you can see, you know, how many ships are taken, or you can think about sort of the operational management of, of particular mobility systems. So we just want to make sure that people are, in addition to understanding that the specifications exist, they can be tailored to the audience based on the needs of the time and purpose that that, that specification is trying to serve. What's most important about all of that is that there are, there's a difference between those that are open and closed. Um, now we talk about purpose a lot more. If we think about that last element, if information is relevant for the operations and is critical for the success of a particular type of business, it may not be in the best interest for that information to be widely available in public. You know, if I am running a highly competitive scooter company, I maybe don't want to have all of my operational data about how I choose to rebalance my scooters and uh, available or my pricing algorithm readily available if I run a car sharing uh, company. I, I may want to have some secrets, um, but there may be some elements of my operations that I would like for them to be open, say the discoverability, so that people can really find and utilize uh, my resources. So what, what this conversation that I'm trying to sort of eliminate right now is that there is a need for open data, um, and now we take it a little bit more to the work that mobility data does, so that people, the traveler, can have free access to it. So the, the data forms that, that we'll talk about today, like GTFS or GBFS, are open. And what that means is they are free to access and or use. That means there's no cost. That means that people can, can readily access. And generally, that, it means that this information can be found quite easily on, on the internet. And that stands in contrast to other standards, for example, that we see on this page, SIE ground vehicle standards, in which you have to pay um, membership organization or you have to pay per usage of, of each one of those standards that, that you see there. So different types of information require different levels of access. And we'll be specifically over the course of today talking about standards that are open. Open can also mean transparently governed. Um, as we saw at the beginning, there are a number of audiences that these things that, that specifications serve, there are a number of timelines that these things serve, and there are a number of purposes that these things can serve. And so maybe in the case of some specifications, it's not that, that every single data feed or every single piece of information that you might want is available, but rather what is available is understanding how those pieces of information came to be. And for us at Mobility Data, we really promote open in all its forms, so being both free and easy to use, but also the second format, which is specifically that is transparently governed. And so you know exactly why and how specific pieces of the specification have come into being. Um, and you can go back and you can look at that process of who voted, why they voted to understand um, why this particular uh, element of the physical world is represented digitally in the same way. And then lastly, we have free as in the access, the use of. And so there, there are many different types of feeds that exist for mobility data and not our organization, but mobility space data. And I think that uh, some of them, like GTFS and GBFS feeds, are you can you can search them online at on, on transit land and, and see them very easily. But there are other people who create those same uh, or very similar types of feeds that are not free to use because they've spent a lot of time, energy, resources developing those feeds and there are commercial value in having them be private. And so for us, again, at Mobility Data, as we talk about that in Transatlantic, when we look at the Transatlantic example, we think of this as a very open way of us using this. And we can see, you know, one of our dear, dear members, Ito World, which, ha which does a lot of this, this work, has a, a way for you to go out. And if you really want to access that information there, you, you can pay for it. And so, again, of mobility data, what we'll be talking about today is like, how do we create and make sure that we advocate for these transparently governed, how we make sure that, that the, the data is open 
meaning that it's free and easy to access. Why open data standards? I think people are probably asking that question right now. It's like, why, why do we think that it's really important for us to have these open data standards? And I think it really helps in a number of, of levels. The first of all is, is when we have things that are transparently governed and we have things that are free and easy to use, the availability for the development of many of these tools goes down. And so that means that the community around the specification and the standard can be of, of a lot of help. And that means that people, specifically governments who spend a lot of time worrying and creating opportunities for there to be mobility for the citizens, don't have to continue to pay over and over again for services that might be similar. As the standards evolve over time, they can change depending on the needs. Um, so as we talked about before, there 10, 15 years ago, there was a need for shared mobility, and now there is, and now we have a standard to represent that. When we have these open data standards, that also means that data can be easily consumed and reused by many people within this ecosystem. And that cuts down on cost for the total ecosystem, maybe not as for individuals as a whole, because that means that the information that exists within the ecosystem can be plucked up. And, and that's really helpful as we put start to think about moving towards mass applications, which many people talk about. If we have uh, standardized data within this ecosystem, then the need for various types of applications or these various types of applications can access information much, much easier. We also know that when we have open data standards, we don't have to continue to reinvent the wheel. If a solution already exists and it's tested, it can be easily applied to other stakeholders. And that is, again, very, very helpful when we talk about governments that oftentimes have constrained resources and don't have the ability to experiment with the latest and greatest, but can, you know, uh, and, and want to use things that, that they know work. And then that's the last thing is that regulatory organizations like mobility data that centralize this can find ways to create effective governance models that uh, oversee the evolution of that standard. And, and when you have people doing it on their own, there's a lot more one-off changes that lead to a lot more confusion. Um, but with open data standards, it provides an opportunity for that to have a community approach, which makes, again, the functioning of the ecosystem a lot easier. Then we have what we call public information, which is, I guess, an element of this, this free to use or free to access. Um, so in many jurisdictions, public data is a right, meaning that the public should know what their government is doing. And as we're talking about mobility data and we're talking about transportation, we're talking about the use of public goods and that regardless if it's public transit or if it's a car or if it's a shared vehicle, it is using a public good, which is our streets that we all collectively pay for. And so in some respects, we're all responsible. Um, all, all of these service operators, uh, mobility operators that operate on our streets have a responsibility for making at least some element of their information public. I mean, obviously there are many debates that we have, we can have about what exactly needs to be public. Um, but in general, I think we can all agree that there are many elements of all of these operations that exist for these companies that, that should be public. And we do that because the public can learn and innovate and that creates opportunities for entrepreneurs or even, you know, citizenpreneurs to take information and make suggestions about what can be used to improve services uh, within their jurisdictions. Also, this open data meets the needs because it allows for there to be scalability. Instead of every single service provider in your city having to sort of jerry-rig some way to put uh, their information out there, it allows for uh, the city to say to come in and, and sort of scale that information very easily because every new organization that comes in and wants to run on the streets and have public information related to mobility services can do it in the same way. And that allows for a much simpler delivery of, of information, which I think we all would want. So the benefits of standardized open data is again, like we said, we can share the public service information without confidentiality issues. The other thing is that you can stimulate tailored solutions to meet multiple and different citizen needs, which we've talked about. And again, we can also allow cities to focus on producing the public services as opposed to producing the related data that comes along with that. We do think that obviously they want to do both, but first and foremost, it, it is actually providing the service and then the data around the services is sort of the second step. So what we want to do is sort of take that uh, work of the technicals, not from them, but we want to ease that work. And open data does that through alleviating the city's need to app development maintenance. If they have limited budgeted, they can always sort of be in compliance by updating the feeds that they produce through this open data. 
And lastly, I think it's important that uh, through open data, the city still control information and can mandate by decree or through various regulations that the data be produced and housed in a certain way, which again provides even more access for those people who may not necessarily be working in the space, but maybe want to research and provide ways for those services to be better. In terms of recommendations, we have some best practices that define how one should use specific standards and specifications. So we define according to the regulations. In general, there's sort of the, the GTFS guidelines that came out of California. We also have produced last year the guidance to cities for shared mobility. And all that is to say we want to just make sure that individuals, as they start to think about what standards they want to, to use, Think about going about it in the right way and making sure that they're choosing the right standard that fits their needs, that it fits the freshness or the, the timeline in which they want to see that data. Is it is it only historical? Is it real time? And that it's of quality and that it's complete. And so our goal is here is to share just some information on how we think you can go about understanding a little bit more about what back best practices exist for GTFS and for GBFS. These are just some recommendations that we have, but I think we'll talk a lot more about that in the coming as you learn more about what those standards and specifications are. Lastly, we'll talk more about mobility data and who we are. We talked a lot about standards and specifications abstractly, and now we're going to talk about it uh, concretely. So Mobility Data is a Canadian nonprofit organization, and we are about 120 members across a variety of geographies, um, including Europe, North America, Latin America, and Asia, Australasia, naturally. And, and we're about 20 employees strong, spread out across these geographies as well. Just to give a little bit of history on us, we started as a project of the Rocky Mountain Institute in 2017, which grew out of those GTFS best practices. And there was a lot of work that was done around making sure the GTFS best practices were really moving forward and creating the, the kind of large scale adoption that is needed to really push GTFS forward. And that resulted in incorporation in Canada as a nonprofit organization in 2019. That's when we officially became Mobility Data. In 2021, last year, our lovely colleague Tuto here uh, got us incorporated in France as a nonprofit organization as an extension of our Canadian entity. So now we're actually operating as an organization here in Europe. And this year, we hope to sort of move that even further and become uh, an officially recognized international organization. Our vision is that Mobility Data believes that uh, the key to optimization of mobility from a social, environmental, and economic perspective requires the travelers to be as informed of their choices and their consequences as possible. And so therefore our vision is that by improving the quality and reliability of traveler information, we support the improvement of the quality of life, we reduce inequity, and reduce the impact of environmental damage and allow economic growth. Our mission is that we enable interoperability and transportation systems. And we do that by identifying stakeholder interest, specifically among stakeholders who, who might see themselves as being not necessarily adversaries, but not seeing themselves in the same, and working on similar problems. And we do that with them by responding with uh, data formats and shared data infrastructure, which we can talk about in terms of specifications and standards and supporting the adoption of standardized data practices worldwide. And so you'll learn a lot more about exactly what that looks like in our scope here, which is that we work in areas that require industry consensus, meaning that we don't work on individual cities or individual agencies or any individuals or organizations, mobility service providers, but rather we work at an industry level. And we do that by improving specifications GTFS, GBFS, which we'll learn a lot more about today. We also promote standardization. So thinking about how do we create standards from scratch that address needs that exist within the ecosystem, which is projects like our general on demand feed specification, which is now GTFS on demand. And we also create canonical documentation that allows for those specifications to be used and for them to interact with other specifications that might exist out there. We also create unique and shared identifiers, which allow us to further industry consensus on specific ways of using language. And then we also create tools that allow for all of the above to be used in a way that furthers the ecosystem as a whole. So I think it's important to note again, that again, we focus on the industry consensus element of it. And if it's specific to a specific city or agency or organization, it's generally outside the scope of mobility data. Our mission is translated into sort of three strategies. And we've talked a lot about the various pieces of what we do, our mission, our vision, our scope. But now we get into the nitty gritty of what exactly we do. 
And there are three pieces. The first, and I would say most important, they're equally important. They all support one another, as you can see here, but, but the pragmatic specifications. So that's really facilitating the community making pragmatic specifications to meet their needs. That's improving our specifications. That's advocating for new specifications. And then we have our high quality data, which is supporting all stakeholders to achieve even higher quality data, allowing for the reallocation of quality control and resources. That's the tools that support these pragmatic specifications and making sure that, you know, as we talked about it in our first section, um, that's your spell checks, that's your grammar checks. That's what we want to do to make sure that people have the specs. Now they make them as high quality as possible. And then we have a thriving ecosystem of inter international stakeholders working to create, use, and improve the data. That's the sort of exchange. Now that we have specifications, now that we know that they're of high quality, how do we use them to ensure that uh, mobility ecosystems in specific jurisdictions are, are better than before? Well, lastly, we'll just talk a little bit about integration, maintenance, and extension of these open source standards. Just so you're aware of, of how GTFS and GBFS adapt and grow to meet the changing needs of producers and consumers, we are a consensus-based organization. So I really like this photo in that we're all pushing the bus forward and it's publicly owned. We're a nonprofit organization and our, our job is really to work in the service of the industry. And while our end goals are individuals and individual travelers, you know, our main stakeholders are the organizations that provide services to those individuals. And so we really, again, want to make sure that those organizations are just alongside of us behind the bus, pushing it forward. One major difference between GBFS and GTFS uh, is the role that cities play as consumers. So we'll talk a little bit more about this within those sections, but obviously the data that is produced as a result of the GBFS and GTFS feeds have different audiences. And so for GTFS, you know, generally public transit organizations are affiliated with or are parts of city governments. And so they are the producers of that data when other organizations such as uh, your trip planning applications might be the producer of it. But as we know with shared mobility, with GBFS, generally cities and governments are not the ones that operate the shared mobility services. And so they're oftentimes wanting to understand what's happening there and they're, they're trying to consume it. Um, and so we think that it's important to really make sure that that distinction between those who produce data and those who consume data is really understood because both are needed for a functioning ecosystem and, and one is not necessarily better than other. And when we talk about community governance, we, we want to make sure that, you know, it is publicly owned, it is consensus based, but it is also created in collaboration with those who must produce it and those who must consume it. In terms of GTFS governance, any stakeholder can suggest a modification or extension and open a vote or veto blocking the adoption process. So meaning that if you are a producer or consumer of data, you can you know, participate very actively in the GTFS. Um, however, for proposal to be adopted, data must be produced or, and data must be consumed. And there needs to be at least three positive votes, including a producer and consumer and no veto vote. So what that means is in order for uh, something to go from idea to be actually included in spec, it must be created by someone who is using it. It must be consumed by someone who wants to use it. And this has to happen in the real world. Like it can't happen in a test environment. It must be actual data that is operational. And then these people, not necessarily the same people, but that at least three people who are three organizations that are using the data or could potentially use the data vote on it. In terms of GBFS governance, very similar, but there's just a, f a few slight differences. So any stakeholder, meaning any user, consumer, or producer can suggest a modification or extension and or open a vote. And whereas anyone in the ecosystem for GTFS could vote in GBFS, any GBFS producer and consumer can vote or veto. And just like GTFS, for the proposal to become part of the release candidate or part of the actual specification, there need to be at least three positive votes. Again, one producer, one consumer, and there's there's no vetoes. And for a release candidate to be part of a, a, an official release, meaning that it's actually put into the code and the standard that lives on GitHub as the, the center that people access, at least one producer and one consumer, they must implement the changes, meaning that they exist as part of their particular operations. So with that, I will stop talking and hopefully you have a clear understanding of what happens around standard specification open source. And now we'll get into the nitty gritty of the specifications that we manage and Tuto will be taking you through this. Thank you, Newton, for walking us through the 
basis of what is a standard, what is a specification, how we move from one to the other, and what does open source mean along with the different tools that we have. So now let's talk about the two standards that we have in-house, GTFS and GBFS. I will give you a technical, very short introduction on both of them, uh, mostly explaining what their core representation is and how it works. But first, before we start, uh, so I get a better idea of the audience I have in front of me, how well do you know GTFS? So you can directly scan the QR code here or go to slido.com and enter GXFS as the code for today's event. Okay, so I see that we have an average score of 2.9. Uh, so let's hope, 2.8. So let's hope I will uh, give you enough details about GTFS to want to learn more. Feel free to reach out to us whenever you have a question. So first and foremost, what does this acronym stand for? GTFS stands for General Transit Feed Specification. It is designed to describe information about the transportation network, so public transit, and it is traveler centric, not operational. So it's very much for the end user, you, I, our friends, our family, anyone who use any kind of public transit uh, options. Before GTFS was created and why there was that need for standardized data is we all knew back then in the days when you had to go to the bus stop and look at the printout to figure out when the bus is, where does it work, and so on. Same with the metro, we had those super huge uh, maps uh, of the network transportation and sometimes we would get lost in it. And the most difficult part is either a spreadsheet, a database, a printout for the map. It was way harder for transport operators to actually share it with trip planning application or third parties and so on. And when a digital format existed, uh, the people who ingest the data would have to have a quite heavy conversion cost to make sure that they can integrate different offers. So that's where standardization come into place. As Newton explained, standards make it way easier to reuse, to create. The yes, it has an initial cost of adoption, but after that, it makes everyone's life much more easier. And ultimately, as we said, our goal being to improve the information giving to the traveler, it very much so help traveler get around. GTFS, as we said, was for traveler facing information and it was also created in the mindset of being a spec for trip planning. So how did it start? Uh, TreeMed started by drafting it and Google was the first consumer to adopt it. So based on this, several iteration uh, happened and, and there was a community governance that was set then it was renamed to the name uh, that we know today. An additional layer of real-time information was added in 2011. And I don't know if you remember, but by 2013, most of us had a smartphone and we were starting to rely more and more on it to get information. And it's when people started relying more and more on information on their phone that we realized that there were a lot of different data sets out there of different quality and a different interpretation of what the specification mean. Uh, so there was a setup of a project that is called the GTPFS Best Practices hosted by the Rocky Mountain Institute that led to us today mobility data. Why did GTFS become such a success? Well, it's very simple. It's easy to produce. Most of the time, the data sets are open, as mentioned by Newton, and it prevents vendor lock-in. So based on these open data sets that were able to be found online in repositories, and the fact that it was so easy and so light, we also saw appear a lot of third party trip planning applications such as CityMapper, Transit, MoveIt. There are so many others after that who were created to cater to specific needs. So let's dive into what does it look like actually, uh, GTFS and in trip planning application. Well, 
if I'm in Germany and I want to go from that point A to that point B, please don't ask me to read the name in German. Uh, that would be awful. Uh, we can use Google Map to decide which option to use. And here we have the option, for example, to use only one operator that is a VBB. And we can make our mind as in when to leave to arrive at a certain time. What GTFS also allows is because it's a standard shared by multiple operators is we can also plan a trip crossing several borders and using different public transit operators again to go from A and B. Uh, and it has several options of trains, buses and so on from these operators. The birth of GTFS and its expansion also created a global ecosystem of open source software. So we have Open Trip Planner that is also interoperable with Netex, that is the European standard. We have mobility apps such as One Bus Away. We also have an uh, app to give us the waiting time protection like Transit Clock and so, so many others. You have the link in the slide to explore them and see if you want to work on them, improve them, use them. The world is yours. Now, let's go into GTFS Schedule 6 core areas. GTFS Schedule is designed as a minimal data set to represent stops, routes, agencies, calendar, trip, and stop time. It also has other optional file, and in each uh, file, they have optional uh, field that I will not detail today, but I will give you an overview of. So in the stop file, we, you have the position of each stop on a map based on coordinates, and you have the name of the stop. And on the right side of the screen, you have a visualization of how it appears in a trip planning application. In the route uh, file or line, if you prefer, uh, you will have a list of the name of the route, its color, and the set of stop that was listed in the previous file that belonged to the line. Then you have a file uh, about transit agencies that will give mostly the operator name. So in the use case we saw before, for example, it was VBB in Germany. So people know which operator that they will travel with. And an homage to the original name of GTFS schedule, it gives you the calendar. So the availability period of that specific service with a start and end date and the day of the week that the service is offered. Obviously, there is always the possibility to say that this bus line is only during the weekend or the weekdays in the evening and so on. In the file trips, you will have the direction name of that line and also uh, the stops that are served in that trip. So the trip name can be a cardinal direction, north, south, east, west, and it could also be a name of a destination, which is more often than not the last stop of the train or the bus. You then have a file with the different stop times. So at each a uh, stop that you have listed in the stop uh, file, then you say you actually give the schedule at that stop. So the bus comes at 12, 12, 12, 12, 34, and so on and so on. It also allows you to give you the waiting time at the stop and the travel time between two stops. So that is actually one of the most important part to get accurately for trip planning application. So those were the six core areas of GTFS that you can represent with what we call a minimal GTFS dataset. On top of it, if you want to improve the information that travelers get, we have created several extensions. And as Newton said, they are uh, led by consensus from the industry. And you see that we have, for example, shapes, if you want to represent what the route looks like in real life for people to get a better visualization, you can also have pathways, for example, that will give you details about that station, if it has elevators or not, if it has staircase or not, that is very important. For example, if you travel with a lot of luggages, uh, you can also have information about the vehicle capacity, if it can take a bike 
or not. Uh, you have details about the different transfers, uh, very important for mobility hubs. You have a detailed description of the station entrance, especially when you live in a city where the train station, for example, has multiple entrance. Here you have a picture of New York, if I'm not mistaken. You also have a pathway routing uh, that is used by one of our member, mostly uh, Navilands, for people uh, who have impaired vision to actually guide them through the train station for them to be able to take a uh, public transit uh, in an independent way. You have boarding areas. We have all known that in a train platforms and so on. We also have translation for countries where there are several official languages, such as Switzerland, for example. You have a stop text to speech that is very helpful in either buses or in subway coaches, especially if you're in a very touristic area, like I'm in Paris. Sometimes the names are a little bit difficult to read for some tourists who might not be versed into Latin alphabet, and it's way easier for them to hear it uh, spoken out. Uh, so, for example, uh, you will have Tour Eiffel, everyone will know they get down to go and see the Eiffel Tower. So that was everything that's possible for static information. So the description of your network. On top of it, uh, there is the edition in 2011, as I said, of a real-time component. Why real-time data? Well, it's very important for us travelers. First, it reduces our anxiety and we know uh, how much we will have to wait. So we can also plan our trip. For example, if I know that the next bus is only 15 minutes away and that my home is five minutes away from the bus stop, maybe I'll take 10 extra minutes to get a coffee, which is a pleasant way to start the day. It will also allow to push information about any kind of service change if the bus can't cross the street, for example. And it, all of that helped the traveler feel that there is trust between the traveler and the network operator, that the traveler is also a little bit more in control of the choice of their mobility options to go from A to B, and it allows them to make more informed choice. And again, as Newton say, it falls back onto what we have as a mission and a vision. GTFS Real Time today has four main use cases, trip updates, localization of vehicle, service change, and service alert. So I will detail these four. For the trip updates, you will see, for example, an update of the waiting time in the trip planning application. So you know if the train is late, the bus is on time, uh, and you also have, for example, in the Move It application, the real time availability of at the next stop. What GTFS real time also allows you to do is to actually have the localization of vehicles. And one of our members, for example, uh, Zenbus does that for several operators. And as a user, it also makes the transit network way more attractive. I think we all got used somehow to all the TNCs showing where the car is, seeing where the bus is, is also very nice for you to make sure you catch the bus in that morning. A third pillar of the GTFS real time is service change. So for example, if a station is closed, so you will get in the, the notification in your trip planning application and you know that you can either change the way you are commuting or if you're stopping at the previous stop and you can walk the rest uh, of the trip and then it will usually mean, for example, that you will not wear heels that day. A last part of the GTFS real time is the service alert. Uh, it's an explanation of why there might be a disruption of services. For example, there's construction, there was a crash, or there is a protest out in the street, uh, an explanation of the consequences of that service interruption, and also usually the duration of its uh, interruption. All of this is used by producers, as Newton explained, so they're the ones who are actually creating the data using GTFS. There can be transport agencies, software vendors. You have a couple of icons and example here. Uh, as of today, there is not a repository of all the existing sources, but as Newton said, we are working on a global database that has for now listed over 1,200 providers with over six location. Again, if you check out our repository, if it's not complete, let us know. And then once the data is produced, when uh, the data set is out there, when 
the book is written if you want. Uh, there are consumers, so people who will read it, ingest it. It can be more uh, trip planning application, as we said, accessibility analysis software, universities, and so on. You have a couple of examples again on the slide. But because we have seen the industry grow more and more, we have seen a lot more application of GTFS, maybe the next step would be booking or payment. So in a summary, the pipeline for GTFS is to have one entity to produce the data, transit operator, for example, in that standardized format. Then it will be pushed to a consumer, for example, a map, a trip planning application, a mapping application that then will then push it to the traveler who used these application to make that decision. I hope I was clear on GTFS. So let's move to GBFS. Same as before, tell me all about your knowledge about GPFS. Oh, uh, Maricela, you don't see the cardinal direction in trips. Oh, it's the name that you give to your trip. Actually, some line, for example, can be north to south or west to east. It's very for, uh, much for you to decide the representation of the network. So I see there are questions from Maricela about the direction in the trips.txt file. And then there is Harsh asking me about shapes. Oh, I, I didn't realize I could unmute. Hi, this is Maricela. I'm from, I'm from uh, Via Metropolitan Transit in San Antonio. One of the things that I, I think is a need for us is to be able to have the cardinal directions. And I see in your presentation that you do have, you had Sud, right, South? Yeah, but I don't understand how you, you're doing that. What field are you using for that? I see the direction ID as part of the trips table and we generally have zero and one in there. So that's just one direction yes. or another. So. Yes, correct. So what I should have clarified is in the presentation that I had, uh, Sud North or South North, East West, where actually the direction name given by that specific transit operator to their line instead of the two end points of the trip. So it's not really a cardinal direction per se. It was more to say that the, the name of the trip could be either cardinal direction or actual name. It's well noted of your suggestion to add this to the GTFS. So we will actually bring it back to our specification team. And that is part of our community process. We are also here to take into account what is missing so we can suggest it to the community. And if it's also missed by other people, then maybe it will be uh, added as an optional field. They're using trip head sign. Is that what you're saying? They're using trip yes. head sign instead. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Thank, yes. thank you. Yes. So I see that for GBFS, the score is a little bit lower. So let's walk through it. And we're lucky to have expert one uh, major expert in the room, so he will help me out if you have questions. So first and foremost, what does the acronym GBFS stand for? It means General Bike Share Feed Specification. With the same parallel as GTFS, this time it is used to describe information about shared mobility option. And again, it is traveler centric. Back then, in 2014, when that whole idea sparked of creating GBFS, I don't know if you remember, but when you were in the search of how many bicycles are available to rent in different cities, you would have a different way to represent it, different field, different name, depending on the cities. But even you would have different looking file altogether in a different format. And when you were going through them, it's a little bit difficult to understand exactly what was meant. So if you're an integrator, it would make your life even harder to resurface mobility option. And obviously travelers had to download an app per city or an app per operator to uh, get the gist around. And it might be a little bit more complicated for users. So. The whole idea was let's do the same as for GTFS and let's create an open standard that will allow collaboration, such as the discussion we've just had about how to add field, for example, or to add file that will be based on a consensus among the industry. And that will also allow us to be flexible enough to adapt to the constant change of shared mobility. Again, shared mobility is very young, but we have seen a lot of different options appear. 
it led to how does BFS look today, very much like the specification of the food pleasure index that Newton presented. You have a very clear file of what's the field name, if it's required, yes or no, what type of information do you have in the field, and uh, how it is defined. Same as for GTFS, GBFS was planned as a spec first and foremost for trip planning. So 2014, Mitch that we have in the room, thank you Mitch, drafted the GBFS and it was endorsed by NAPSA in 2015 with the first implementation of the V1 in uh, 2016 by Motivate, Social Bicycle, B-Cycle, PBSE and so many others. In 2017, we saw the rise of electric scooters, darkless bike share, free floating operations, and so on. So what Mitch created first for bike sharing uh, with station had the need to evolve to encompass bigger uh, solutions. And it's when uh, we were chosen to govern and improve on it. So what happened since then is now GPFS is not just about bikes anymore. So it's free floating scooters, it's car sharing options and so on. So over the last three years now, we have expanded the scope of GPFS. We have also stabilized the governance process that Newton has introduced to you earlier. We created a versioning process and we went to the industry to ask for their needs and to try and understand better what needed to happen for GBFS to represent uh, better the reality of the industry today. And similarly, as for GTFS, we also developed best practices uh, to make sure that the community built around GBFS can use it better and we expand its adoption. As mentioned before, we keep on surveying the industry. So you might have seen this appear a couple of times in your email. We're always asking for your inputs. It's always uh, welcome in the sense that we want to make sure that GBFS keeps on par with the evolution of the industry. And to support that, we also provide technical and non-technical workshops, such as the one today, to give you a first introduction of GBFS because it's a little bit more recent. It needs a little bit more attention uh, and it needs a lot of love from you. We have also developed and recently revamped entirely a resource center that will give you all the details about it. So who's using it, you will ask me? Well, we have in our catalog over uh, 645 systems that we know of that are located in 40 different countries. Again, this is not exhaustive. It's only based on our knowledge. So if you know of any system that is not listed in our catalog, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, for example, we know that Japan is looking into it and it's very exciting. So what does GBFS do and what does it represent? It is compared to GTFS that had two components, static and real time in two different formats. This time it's combined in one. You will have some static information, for example, the location of a station, if it's station based. But first and foremost, it is based on real time information for the availability of the vehicle and the dock, if it's a station base, you will also know about the status of the station, if it's full or empty, uh, which has a lot of importance when you're using a bike share uh, option with a docking system. If the station is full, well, you will have to go to the next station to end your trip. It will also provide uh, some other static information, such as the business rule, the pricing, and so on. More and more cities today are using GPFS to describe their shared mobility services. And it's also the format that they request from the shared mobility operators to resurface information about their services. So a couple of screenshots of how it might look like in an app. So you see the dots of where the stations, for example, you can also calculate uh, your trip and estimate the time uh, spent on a scooter, for example, here. What are the core areas of GBFS? So it represents the system, the stations that can be physical or virtual, the vehicle. So again, not only bikes, but also scooters, like in this picture or cars, the rules related to the travel, the pricing and the alert 
again, real-time information, letting you know if it's available or not, or if there is an interruption of services. GBFS is written in JSON. Why? Because it's a lightweight data interchange format. So it's easy to store, easy to exchange. Again, since it's real-time information, it will be updated constantly. So if it's too heavy, then you will saturate the memory of the machine. And honestly, for people who are not coding like me, it's very easy to use or at, at least to read I can comprehend what's on the screen that I show you right now. Uh, and it's at the same time, very easy for machine to pass and generate. So as we have mentioned before, there are several versions of GBFS that existed throughout the time. And starting from the version 1.1, at the beginning of all JSON files included on the GBFS feed, you will have the version mentioned. So here in the example, it's 2.3, which is our latest official release. And if you don't see it, then you can assume that the version is 1.0. And why it is important is because GBFS has a history and it was implemented for the past seven to eight years, one operator can choose to have different GBFS feeds based on different versions to comply with requests from either the local authorities or the trip planning application they're working with or any other people consuming their data. So this is very important also to define what's in the field of each file. As I said, our latest release, which became official very recently, earlier this month, is GBFS version 2.3. And one of the main changes that happened is thanks to the community of uh, French stakeholders and operators in car sharing. Now GBFS fully support uh, car sharing, or at least to the best of our capacity for now. And we also added the description of stations that have a charging ability. We also refined the drop-off restriction of vehicle, which we have seen more and more out in the street, like e-scooters, free floating scooters can't be parked anywhere anymore. It creates too much noise on the street. We also added some information about the vehicle icon, the brand information. So you can see a little icon like you see on the screenshot here uh, on the trip planning app. You can also hold a vehicle for a certain time. So it avoids, for example, a little bit of disappointment from a uh, user. When you see that a scooter is available five minutes away from you, you can hold it for five minutes and make sure that you get that one instead of having to look for the next one. It also have a better or more exhaustive description of pricing plan per vehicle type. Since we know that, for example, an e-bike can have a different pricing than a classic bike to rent. And also terms and privacy policy have been resurfaced. You will find all the detail on the GitHub link that is at the bottom. How is GBFS structured? It's a collection of 13 files. Some of them are optional, some are conditionally required, and some are required, if not you cannot share the information. In total, there is more or less 150 files and same field and same as files. Some can be required or not, depending on the type of services you're running, if you're having stations or not, depending if you're on scooters or bikes or cars and so on. So let's dive into each of these files. First, we have gbfs.json, which is an auto discovery file that link all the different files of the data set. So it's required for all system and it will help represent uh, one single system. It contains the name and location and language of each file. And why is this important is again, GBFS being real time, it changes a lot. So it's good to have a place where people can actually just use the link and the machine does the rest to get updated information. Then we have a file, uh, systeminformation.json, that will give globally the general information about the system. So the name that the people will see, the language, the time zone, a contact email, for example, or phone number, an URL for people to get more information, and so on. It helps the user understand which operator they will choose for the trip. Another file, vehicle type JSON, is this one, the definition of each vehicle type in the system. So it has unique ID 
per vehicle type. So you can have, for example, ABC123 for all your scooters and ABC456 for all your e-scooters. And as you can see, you can choose uh, the type of vehicle that is bicycle, car, moped, scooters, and so many others. You can also add information about propulsion type. Human would be classic, us having to pedal, uh, electric assist, electric combustion, and so, so many others. Uh, and it will also give a name of the vehicle along with a maximum range per meter. It is even more important for electric vehicle or car sharing, then it helps getting a better understanding of where I can go if I choose this car. The following file is station information, and it's where you have information about a station if you're using virtual station or a physical station within your system. So you have the description of the station, where it is located, its short name if you want, and you also have the deep link for rental, which is important because then people can actually use this when they see it in the trip planning application and get onto your own operator application to actually activate the rental. Still on the station, you have a file that is about the status of the station. It updates more or less every two minutes, and it will give you a number of available vehicles at that station and also available dock. As I said earlier, if it's completely full, then the person knows that they will have to ride to the next station to end their trip. And it also gives details about where the station is. We also have a file that is about the status of the bike. So this one is exactly the core of GBFS, I would say. Where is an available bike? So you have where the uh, vehicle is, or the scooter, the moped, the car, what type of vehicle it is. Again, a deep link for rental. And you also have, very important for the users, the pricing plan for that specific vehicle. We have another file that describes the service hours of the system, uh, and it's optional, but it must include at least one object somewhere to identify the uh, service for every day of the week. You can also choose with this file to differentiate the opening hours of your services for your members and non-members. There is another very important file for timing is calendar. And it's very much in use for operations that are seasonal, as you can see on the picture. Sometimes, well, due to heavy snow, uh, the system is only operating in the spring period or for example, here between April and November only, because after that, it's, uh, the snow is too heavy for people to ride. The next file is the region that is a subset of system, and it can be a political jurisdiction, neighborhood, economic zone. We know of operators who operate in very big megapolis, so it will help them identify which region that are operated, and it also gives, for example, the option to have different pricing per region. You have system alert that gives any information about interruption of services, for example, or any change in the system and so on. So very similar to the GTFS real time we had before. We also have a file of geofencing. So geofencing is a fancy way to say that it's a description of virtual boundary sets in a specific area. So for example, speed limits in downtown Paris. It can also be used in GPFS to give information about where you are no right zones or when you have, as I said before, a drop of zones that dedicated, as we saw in the street of Lisbon, that you can only park your scooter at specific places. Last file that I will present to you today is the system pricing plan. So in this file, you describe everything that relates to your pricing, how it works, the currency, if you have taxes or not, and you can also have different type of pricing within the same file, again, based on different bike or different status and so on. What's next for GBFS? Hopefully within this year, we will have a version 3.0 that will be our next major release that will have different changes to it. A data license requirement, for example, and one that we are attached to is now it's not just bikes anymore as I've 
kept on explaining. So we will change all the places where it's bike to vehicle. We will also look into changing the way that the hours and dates are described, falling back on OpenStreetMap configuration. So it will depreciate the system hours and system calendar endpoints. We will also keep with the rotation of the ID that is now reinforced in GPFS, and we will do the same for DeepLink uh, to be privacy by design to protect all of us as users. And geofencing that I explained earlier, we know it's something that is a little bit more complicated to do, to represent. So we will look into making it simpler for producers and consumers. Let me quickly see. I see that there are mostly questions on GTFS. So for the five minutes that we have left together, let's deep dive into what tools and ecosystem we have built around these two standards. So let's start by the quality of data. So we have worked within the high quality data team to make sure that we provide better documentation to support the specification and it is translated in best practices. That is how mobility data was created and born, but also how to guide, how to produce, how to consume. And we have also tried to make sure that there are better data example for you to understand how to use the specification. And all this, thanks to the amazing work of my colleagues, including Jose in the room that I can see, we have now completely revamped documentation platform that is your one source to find any answer on our specification, including the list of tools and so on. The links are here. I invite you to visit it. We have also built open source tools. First, the validator that will tell you if your data set complies to the specification, and we have done so for GTFS schedule, GTFS real time, thanks to the support of the University of South Florida, and GPFS thanks to the support of Fluctio. We also have for GTFS schedule a grading scheme that will allow you to compare what's in real life with what is in the data set. So for example, if the bus station is at the right location or not, if the bus line has the right color and so on. Still on high quality data, we have also worked to make sure that our specifications are fully interoperable with European standards. We have uh, released earlier this year a canonical mapping between GPFS, Siri and NetX, and we will release very soon the same for GTFS. We are also making sure that we work in full cooperation with the Open Mobility Foundation for MDS and Tom PPI and CDSM that are European based for booking payment, but also a collection of use cases and standards to the benefit of the city. And upcoming, very excited about that to make sure that data globally in the world is of a better quality. We will be looking into doing some language clarification. I know that Mitch here in the room, thank you, have done a lot of work to try and precise between the must, the should, the could, that could be confusing for non-native English speakers and globally it supports everyone, but we're very excited. We also look into translating our resource center, so the documentation platform that we have revamped in nine different languages to make sure that we can expand the adoption of these standards. So for example, in Japanese, as we said before for GPFS, which we're very excited about, if there is any language you would like to see translated into, please drop us a line. We will be very happy to have reviewers, to take inputs and so on. On the thriving ecosystem part, as Newton said, once you have an open data, it's also a matter of finding it to make sure that an integrator has a life facilitated when it comes to resurfacing several mobility options. So for the GTFS, we have the database that is a repository of over 1,300 data sets. Emma recently, our product manager, presented how to use it. It has a repo on GitHub and it also has a CSV that you can pass, that you can look through and so on. We also have the same for GPFS. The catalog CSV is available on GitHub directly in the same repo where you can find the data specification. Thanks, Mitch, for updating it every time that we send you a link. Please, if you know of any system that is not in the catalog, drop us a line. Always happy to list it. And the last part of the thriving ecosystem is today what we're doing here. We're making sure that we're building a community around 
these standards that is balance and also a better representation of the different mobility service operators, the local authorities, the consumers that are out there. So we make sure that there's an balance between public and private entities that we talk to. We also make sure that we have a good geographical representation, uh, Canada, US, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australasia, South America, we are trying to make sure that we hear and listen to everyone. And we also make sure that this community knows how to reach us. So a way to represent our ecosystem would be that our association, our organization, nonprofit is based on members that can vote on, for example, our board of directors, non-voting members who get access to our resources, and then all the data producers and consumers out there that Newton has alluded to earlier today, and globally, the industry, because we have other people who are not producers, not consumers, for example, national access point. The footprint of our ecosystem today on a map, you can see we try slowly but surely to reach out more and more. So you have in dark purple countries where we have members only and in light purple you have countries where we have board members, team members and some members of the nonprofit. So as you can see, we're trying to get a better coverage. If you're not a member yet and you want to get involved, we have a special package for you that you uh, can find at this link. It balances out your resources in terms of time uh, with your benefits. But members or not, and it will be for my last minute, we need you. We need you to produce and publish data. We need you to consume data. We need you to support open data and spread the word about our specification. And we need you to join the conversation to make sure that our standards keep on evolving and represent what you need in the industry. So I've seen that there are a lot of questions and discussion in the chat. For the one who must live, thank you for your time with us. Thank you for learning more about us and thank you for all your future contribution. We're very much looking forward to it. So Fernando, you have a question about the estimated time, correct? So that is indeed a question that the GTFS real-time community had a lot. Uh, should we focus more on the vehicle position or should we uh, focus more on the estimate time of arrival? It hasn't been solved yet. So a lot of people actually use this one, the trip updates, to have the stop time at a certain position. I don't know if you have it uh, within the API that you've been using, Fernando. We are also hosting a workshop during our next event in person that will happen in early June in Montreal to actually have experts around the table to discuss GTFS real time. So uh, hopefully uh, we will also be able to give you more information at that time. If you all agree, I will wish you again a very pleasant continuation of your day. Thank you again for joining us in today and hopefully we will see you all early in June for our summit. More details on our website and if you have any questions feel free to reach us via email. Thank you again for joining today and we do wish you a very pleasant end of the day and end of the week.